Two people walking and chatting, thinking, head scratching about something big that's just been happening. But on the road to Emmaus, from Jerusalem way, two become three as a new man says, Hey, hey, says he, you've been thinking and head scratching. Has something big just been happening? You've not heard about what's been happening? All of Jerusalem have been head scratching. What have I missed? Asks the man. I'd love to know. Please tell if you can. It's about a man called Jesus and we thought he was coming to rescue God's people and send the Romans off running. He did and he said loads of cool stuff from a place up north called Nazareth. He told great stories and he healed the sick. He knew people by name and what made them tick. Remember that wedding? He turned water to wine, brought his friend back to life and his friend felt just fine. He was sharing and caring. Just ask his friend Pete. He walked on the water with only his feet. He said shush to the storm and the storm was still. He did a miracle with bread and thousands were filled. Besides all this, his talk on a hill was full of wise teaching that people quote still. I can't believe it. What a big loss. A man so great who hung on a cross. And on that cross, that's where he died. I feel so tied up in knots inside. And three days have passed, though it feels more like 70, because now we've heard that his tomb is empty. That's right, you heard me. His body is gone. But who take his body? He never did wrong. You're confused, said the man, and seem out of the picture. So let me show you what it says in the scripture. It was always the plan, right from the start. Because Jesus loved you with all of his heart, he died on the cross, but rose from the tomb. He came back to life so you can live too. And as they were chatting and still head scratching, two of them stopped, but the third kept on walking. Hey, don't go, please, the two say. The sun's gone to bed, so why don't you stay? Good point, says the third. Day has turned to night. I'll stop over with you two and let's grab a bite. And as they sit down to eat, they close their eyes. He thanks God for the meal. Then, what a surprise. The two people stare and then rub their eyes. It's Jesus, not gone, but fully alive. And before they say seconds, there's more bread going round. Jesus just vanishes. He cannot be found. The two are left thinking and really head scratching. They had just been with Jesus. Something big was happening. We must say we've seen Jesus, so tie up your shoes. Quick, to Jerusalem. There's no time to lose. All along it was Jesus, the very same one. They'd been searching the scriptures with God's precious son. It's the biggest story that's ever been told about Jesus who's risen. It never gets old. The two met with Jesus in the most surprising way. They shared the story and we still share it today. Have you resisted temptation to the point of shedding blood? Have you endured persecution to the point of giving up? Do you even realize that there's a battle raging strong over your thoughts and over your purity? And this battle will last your entire life long. So here's what I'll do, I'll tell you where it all began. In Genesis 1 and 2, Adam and Eve in the garden walking hand in hand. Eve sunbathing, just working on a tan. Adam running through the fields, just trying to be the man. You see, that's when things were right. There were no murders in the middle of the night. There was no cancer invading bodies. There was no strife. But sin cut the cord of humanity's life. You see, in Genesis 3, Adam and Eve believed the lies. The lies that to this day are still robbing you and I. Here are the lies. That we are our own purpose. That life exists only on this surface that love, joy, honour, that we deserve it. You see, we're still listening to the serpent. The enemy knows you better than you know yourself, and he hates you. He wants to choke out your breath, stop your heart by cardiac arrest, ruin your name, your life, your family, until there's not anything left. 
But sin set in motion God's redemptive plan. For God so loved the world that he would send his son to man to rescue, to redeem, to reconcile all things back to himself. And it was in this God-man that the Father's fullness was pleased to dwell. And Christ was sent on mission to conquer hell. He would take the sin of this world and he would bear it as his own. And the wrath that you and I both deserve was transferred to him alone. And like a lamb led to slaughter, our Saviour didn't make a sound, wearing whiplashes as a robe and thorns as a crown, carrying his cross around town. And with his arms outstretched, he hung, blood and water flowing down. With my finite mind, it doesn't make any sense that he gets my sin and I get his righteousness. And so my king was laid in a grave, not breathing, his mother weeping, the predestined dying day. But three days later, the stone had been rolled away, and truth be told, death couldn't hold. The enemy couldn't keep him in that grave. Because my king is no longer dead, that serpent bruised his heel while Christ's foot was smashing his head. And our fears and our insecurities, those things have been put to bed. We live the life that Christ provides through his dying breath. He is risen from the grave, and God has given him a name, a name that is worthy to be praised. The only name that saves is Jesus, Jesus, God's only son. There's a battle raging strong, but the war is already won. Because he sits in victory at his father's right side, and he's got scars in his hands, scars in his feet, a scar on his side. But it's through those scars that we have life. It's through those scars that we have strength to fight. So let's fight. Fight with all your might. Don't waste your life. I'm telling you that there's going to be strife. But our king holds the keys to hell, and he's about to turn off the light. So believe on Jesus. He was born, died, and was raised to free us. He's the way, the truth, and the life, God's only son. There's a battle raging strong, but the war is already won. Luke chapter 23, verses 32 to 43. Two other men, both criminals, were also led out with him to be executed. When they came to the place called the Skull, they crucified him there, along with the criminals, one on his right, the other on his left. Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they are doing. And they divided up his clothes by casting lots. The people stood watching, and the rulers even sneered at him. They said, He saved others. Let him save himself if he is God's Messiah, the Chosen One. The soldiers also came up and mocked him. They offered him wine vinegar and said, If you are the king of the Jews, save yourself. There was a written notice above him which read, This is the king of the Jews. One of the criminals who hung there hurled insults at him. Aren't you the Messiah? Save yourself and us. But the other criminal rebuked him. Don't you fear God, since you are under the same sentence? We are punished justly, for we are getting what our deeds deserve. But this man has done nothing wrong. Then he said, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. Jesus answered him, Truly I tell you, today you will be with me in paradise. Well, good morning and a happy Easter to you. The question we're asking you this morning here at church this Easter Friday morning is this question, what are you searching for? What are you searching for? Not just metaphorically, but literally. What have you been typing into Google lately when you're in private, in front of the screen? Because what we type into this little window says a lot about what's really on our hearts and minds. Not just a search on the net, but a search in life. You see, the truth is, all of us in one way or another like to project an image of ourselves. These days, often through social media. Uh, we do it through our Facebook statuses. Uh, we tell this story in our Instagram 
pictures or our photo albums, our Twitter posts, our Christmas newsletters or our LinkedIn profiles and our resumes. But you see, for all of your and my efforts to project an image, to tell a story about ourselves that we want the rest of us, the public, to believe, what we type in here, what we type in this little search engine, tells a truer story of literally what our hearts and our minds are searching for. Not the polished story that we want to present, but the raw story of our real selves in private. The questions our hearts and minds are really asking. The search we're on. So it's fascinating uh, with the help of this uh, ABC report to gather up some of the big questions that Aussies have actually been asking. That might surprise you. The big why we spent 2018 typing into Google. We're number two on the list. Yes, you mightn't be surprised about this one. Was why is today, why is it called Good Friday? The question is, what's so good about Good Friday? But for context, I think it's fair. Uh, before coming to that most excellent question for today is, well, what were the rest of the nine questions? The top 10 questions that Aussies asked in 2018. Now, what do you reckon number 10 was? Well, this is what number 10 was. Why is my poop green? <laughs> it's true, it was number 10. Now, maybe it's a dieting thing that Dr. Zeus anticipated. You know, those books we read when we were kids. But look, it does get a little bit more serious from here. Why is Nick Cummins called the honey badger? Truly, it was number nine. Why is my internet so slow? <laughs> Possibly it's because somebody else in the, in the house is, is, is asking question number 10 about their poop being green. <laughs> number seven, why is Australia Day celebrated? Number six, why is Anzac Day so important? Why is Tim Carhill not playing the soccer tonight? <laughs> why is Australia Day January 26th? And how did Russia get into the Winter Olympics under the name OAR? And then, of course, there's that most excellent question for today at number two. Why is it called Good Friday? Beaten, interestingly, by one other question, by the greatest religion in our country, why is state of origin on Sunday? Now, I'm sure the question in Victoria was a bit different, but nevertheless, it's a good question, isn't it? It's a funny mix for our nation in its Google searches. Sport, national issues, an unfortunate personal issue. <laughs> but some big questions about big days, of course, in our calendar, Anzac Day and Australia Day. And then this day, today, Good Friday. Why is it called good? What's so good about Good Friday? Because straight up, it's much easier to think about what's not good about today, what's not good about Good Friday. But when you stop and think about it, it actually isn't good, is it? That an innocent man, a man that even Pontius Pilate recognised was innocent, was executed. As we heard in the video earlier, this man Jesus, who spent his entire life and ministry doing such good things, you can read his story, seen by the eyewitnesses, healing people, feeding the hungry, teaching the empty-hearted. How on earth is it good that the best man in human history, the only man who truly could be called good, is executed on a cross? That an innocent man is murdered alongside criminals who are getting what their deeds deserve. That clearly is not good. This scene of Jesus crucified at a place called the Skull, where his crown was pierced with the crown of thorns. It is not a good thing. And it's not good as he hangs on that cross. It's not good as he hangs on that cross. Uh, that we hear others saying it's not good either. The crowd watched Jesus die. The rulers, uh, they sneer. They say, he saved others, 
let him save himself if he is God's Messiah, the Chosen One. The soldiers, they join in the mockery, driving in insults alongside the nails. They say, look, if you are the king of the Jews, if you are the one the people say you are, well, come on down from the cross and save yourself. And even one of the criminals hanging next to him hurls insults at Jesus. Aren't you the Messiah, he says? Save yourself and us. It is not good as Jesus hangs there on the cross. The crowd says, save yourself. The rulers of the people say, save yourself. The soldiers who nail him there say, save yourself. And the criminal hanging next to Jesus says, save yourself. And as we listen to it all, all those voices, it's not good in the, in the slightest. But now listen to Jesus and let God's truly good word about this day come into focus. What's so good about Good Friday? What's so good is this, is Jesus could have done what those around him were urging him to do. He could have saved himself. He had all of heaven's power to do that. But he chose to stay there, to save you, to save me, to save people from every land and nation and time and place. And as the people hurled their insults at Jesus... Listen to his reply. Listen to the words that come from his lips. Father, forgive them. Father, forgive them. Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they are doing. Friends, that's what's truly good about Good Friday. Forgiveness for the people who put Jesus on that cross. And in a sense, it wasn't those who were just physically there who put him on the cross. We, the whole human race, who have rebelled against God in every time and place. We all put him there. As one criminal hurls insults at Jesus, if you are the king of the Jews, save yourself. Remember, another one says from the other side of the cross, I'm guilty, but you are innocent. Remember me, Jesus. Remember me. Forgive me. Could the words of this criminal actually bear fruit could they be true and what does Jesus say in response he says to him turning to that man truly I tell you today you will be with me in paradise see friends that's what's so truly good about Good Friday forgiveness for the guilty paradise for the forgiven because the death of Jesus is truly the death of death's power. And death's power is connected to our universal rebellion against God. Yes, it's Friday where Jesus dies on the cross, but Sunday is coming. For the true story of Jesus announces that death, which takes up us all, isn't final. In Jesus we see paradise from God is coming. For he came back to life. Here's what's good about Good Friday. The promise he spoke to that criminal who hung next to him on the cross, that criminal who trusted in Jesus, that same word is a word that he speaks to you today. It is a word that speaks in every time and place in every nation. If you will do what the criminal did that day, you will be with Jesus in paradise. That's what's so good about Good Friday. At the foot of the cross... From all sectors came this word to Jesus. Save yourself. Use your power. Save yourself. Save yourself. But a different word comes from the lips of the one, Jesus, who hangs on the cross. A word that says, he is dying there to save you. And that if you trust him, you will be in paradise. Friends, what are you searching for? What does your entry into the Google search engine say about what you're searching for? If forgiveness sounds like it's worth searching for, if paradise from God sounds like it's worth searching for, well, here at the foot of the cross of Jesus, the search is over. Hear the words of Jesus spoken from the cross that day. Father, forgive him. Father, forgive her. You will be If you trust in me, you will be with me in paradise. 
And as you hear those words of Jesus, remember that the God who comes in the person of Jesus, he knows the real you. <laughs> he knows the real me. He, he's not fooled by the public presentation that we try to make to others. He knows what we're truly searching for in our hearts and minds. He knows the things that we would love to erase from our life story, whether it's the online story or the real story we live in this world. He, he knows what we'd love to have forgiven and erased and forgotten. And do you know what? That's exactly what he does for us at the cross in Jesus. He knows it. He knows it all. And if like the criminal hanging next to Jesus, we look to Jesus, we are completely forgiven in the court, in the place that it really matters before God. You see, because Jesus dies to bring you home to God. And Good Friday is so good because God wants you and I to hear that word spoken from the lips of Jesus at the cross. Father, forgive him. Father, forgive her. You will be with me in paradise. And as you hear that word, friends, join us this Sunday as Jesus asks and answers a question of his own, where he answers the question where we are searching for life. We ask, where can we find the good life? And on Easter Sunday, in the resurrection of Jesus, we find God's answer to that question. Friends, it's Good Friday and Easter Sunday is coming. Would you join with me as I pray? Heavenly Father, thank you for the words of Jesus as he hung on the cross, while those other words around him urged him to save himself. Thank you, Lord Jesus, that you stayed there and you used God's great power in your death to bring us forgiveness. Thank you for the word that you spoke to that criminal next to you on the cross who asked you to remember him. And you extended to him your, your Heavenly Father's great forgiveness. Heavenly Father, help us to see how good this day really is by each of us accepting your word of forgiveness and like that criminal who hung next to you, Lord Jesus, that we would know that beyond this life we will be with you in paradise.